All right, welcome to Immunity, where we get to talk about the specifics of white blood cells um, in more detail than we did in the last PowerPoint, as well as give some really sort of timely uh, information about how cells and tissues deal with viral infections, among other things. So let's waste no time and just get started. So this PowerPoint focuses primarily on specific defenses, and that is because nonspecific immunity is really just basically what neutrophils and eosinophils uh, do in general, along with some of the other kinds of cells. So uh, immune generalists, so to speak, um, cells that are willing to go after uh, any number of a specific kind of pathogen. So for example, bacteria are the speciality of neutrophils, and within neutrophils they don't uh, specialize on one kind of bacterium. So it, it's not the case, for example, that a neutrophil would say, be willing to eat a Staphylococcus bacterium, but not willing to eat a Pseudomonas aeruginosa bacterium. Um, it does not care at all what kind of bacteria. Its whole deal is kill bacteria if spotted, doesn't matter what kind, and then eat them. So specific defenses are as they sound, more specific, meaning that uh, cell surface markers, which we'll talk about, are designed to stick to very specific pathogens. So not just bacteria in general, but one bacterium in particular, or not just viruses in general, but the specific strain of flu from two years ago. Um, so that's what specific means, one pathogen and one pathogen only. So we've got two sort of categories of specific defenses, and these are cell-mediated versus antibody-mediated. So to give you an idea of each of them in general before we dive into the specifics, cell-mediated immunity is cell-on-cell -cell violence directly. So one cell coming up to another cell and saying, hey, you don't belong for some reason, and directly attacking it, cell-to-cell. Antibody-mediated immunity is the production of antibodies against the particular pathogen in question, and then the antibodies either directly destroy or tag for destruction the pathogen of interest. So both of these kinds of immunity are carried out by lymphocytes, but different kinds of lymphocytes. So cell-on-cell -cell violence is done by T cells, and antibody-mediated immunity is done by B cells. So quick reminder about antigens. Uh, you were introduced to antigens in the blood chapter, and I was careful to point out that antigens are not specific to blood cell surface markers. An antigen is anything that triggers an immune response. So they're usually proteins, but not always. Um, for example, glycoproteins in the case of uh, blood cell surface antigens, but there are lots and lots of antigenic materials in the environments we live in, um, and they can include entire pathogens or parts of pathogens. So for example, maybe like a specific protein that hangs off a capsule of a specific bacterium, like that thing, or products of pathogens. So these can be things like toxins produced by bacteria, uh, or other foreign compounds, so things like venoms, pollen, etc. Uh, maybe plant parts that you have allergies to. Um, Ruchiol is a uh, poison ivy and poison oak foreign compound that is not alive but is nonetheless antigenic. So huge variety. This is just a very cursory uh, sort of surface level list. So the general properties of immunity. Um, so another way to say this is when I say immunity in a physiological context, what is it that I mean? And what parts are there? So one is specificity which is another way of talking about recognition. So just meaning, to what extent is your immune system, the cells that are members of it, to what extent are they capable of encountering a pathogen 
memorizing it, and then responding more quickly next time. And this is going to depend, of course, on the size and shape of the antigen and whatever receptors are present on T and B cells. It also depends on memory cells. So these are the cells that stick around after the immune system has won a fight. So let's say you got chickenpox as a child and your immune system was very active while you were fighting off chickenpox. After that, you know, you didn't need as many immune cells kicking around because the infection had been defeated, but you still have memory cells from that time that remember what part of the chickenpox virus looked like so that if you're exposed to it again, your immune system can mount a response that's so robust and so quick that you never get sick. And that's also the basis of vaccines. Tolerance is a critical component, and that's because tolerance means we don't attack our own cells and tissues. Now, obviously, this isn't perfect, right? Because, of course, you have autoimmune disorders. But autoimmune disorders are the exception rather than the norm. Um, so chronic exposure to non-self antigens um, can create tolerance to them. Um, but more importantly, we need to be able to not attack our own cells and tissues. Versatility is the final piece of the puzzle. So if you were confused when I said T and B cells recognize pathogens, you might be wondering, well, like, well, which one, with which pathogens do B cells versus T cells recognize? The answer is lots of them. So of your total population of B cells, for example, some of those B cells remember chickenpox. Some of those B cells remember a rhinovirus that you got three years ago over Christmas. Some of those B cells remember the last time you got food poisoning. So B cells all look the same on a superficial level, but as far as what receptors they express on their surface, which gives them their specificity, that varies a lot. So that's what I mean when I say versatility and diversity. Within the T and B cells that you have, T and B describes their job. It says nothing about which specific pathogens they remember. So there are thousands of cells in each population, and a population is defined as a group of cells that all remember, I can't spell today, and respond to one pathogen. So in the event that you are re-exposed to a remembered pathogen, then you get a process called clonal selection initiated. Um, and we'll talk about that as well. So stay tuned for more on that in the near future. So ordinarily in class when I'm teaching this in person, I ask if anybody knows who this is. Uh, and then usually some people say Boba Fett because of the mask, but it's really Django Fett. And that's because Django Fett was the template for all these guys who are the clones. So that's the whole clone army Star Wars mythology. So this actually is a useful metaphor because the creation of the Jango Fett clone army actually follows clonal selection pretty faithfully. So the idea being, I'm going to use the example of chicken pox again because it's familiar. Um, if a memory cell bopping around in your body encounters part of the chicken pox virus, maybe you got re-exposed to it, maybe you picked your kid up from daycare, and while your kid has had the vaccine for chicken pox, chicken pox is going around their daycare, so you pick up your child and your child is covered in chicken pox, exposing you to it as well. Why don't you get sick? Well, you have a memory cell that remembers chicken pox in your body. That's Django Fett. Once that Django Fett encounters that chicken pox, it begins to rapidly make copies of itself, all of which remember chicken pox and are going to attack the chicken pox virus. So that's the underlying principle. So from one comes many. And the reason that you get many is because these are all going to be super soldiers that are designed to attack one thing and only one thing, and that thing is in my example, chicken pox, but in general, the pathogen of interest. So whatever thing is trying to make you sick that you remember. So how does this work? Well, the original activated cell, so your, our Django Fett here, our cell that remembers the original pathogen, 
gets stimulated to produce thousands of copies of itself. So these are going to undergo mitosis, which means that all of them are genetically identical. Now, you might be saying, duh, I know mitosis produces genetically identical cells. Uh, why are you pointing that out? The reason I'm pointing that out is they need to be genetically identical so that they can all attack the same thing. So that's the idea there. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison. As you can see, quite similar. So we'll get into more about how that system is activated in a little bit, but first I want to uh, sort of look at an overview of cell-mediated versus antibody-mediated immunities. So in cell-mediated immunity, you generally have some sort of an antigen-presenting cell, so cells that are phagocytotic and that will present part of what they've eaten to T cells, and that's what's going to activate the T cells. In antibody-mediated immunity, uh, B cells are activated, and those are going to give rise to plasma cells, and the plasma cells produce antibodies. So again, in cell immunity territory, we've got direct attack, so a cell comes up to another cell and does things to it. In antibody-mediated slash humoral, that's the other way to say that, uh, instead of B cells directly attacking other cells, we get circulating antibodies doing that instead. But regardless, the outcome is the same, and that is get rid of the bad guy. So whatever antigen has triggered this response, it's going to get attacked from two directions, both by antibodies and by T cells in most cases. And that is really effective at staving off infection in most cases. So all of us are constantly exposed to pathogens all of the time. Uh, the reason that we're not constantly getting ill is because we have these wars waging inside of us at all times. We just never notice them for the most part because your immune system is so good at its job that usually the battle is over before you even feel sick. I also do want to point out that um, the activation steps for cell and humoral immunity are interconnected, and I'll show you more about what's inside of these little uh, sort of reciprocal arrows as we move forward. So if you're wondering about this part of this diagram, you will get more information about it, I promise. Okay, so I mentioned antigen-presenting cells. And, you know, I've actually uh, talked about antigen-presenting cells before, so in 241, after chapter 4, we have chapter 5, and chapter 5 is the integumentary system. So the integumentary system is actually where you met your first antigen-presenting cell. Um, and you might remember that it's the Langerhans slash dendritic cells of the skin. They are specifically in the stratum spinosum. So instead of reading all of the stuff on this slide to you, I'm going to explain it using an analogy, which is the exact same analogy I used to explain the longer Hans cells of the skin. Um, I will talk about the MHC protein specifically because that's new information that's harder to understand, but to understand sort of the general rules of antigen presentation, here's how this works. So the antigen presenting cells are kind of like mall security guards or mall cops. Paul Blart Malkop, if you're familiar with the movie. So private security guards have limited authority. They cannot, for example, arrest you legally or file charges against you or do the things that actual policemen can do. What they can do, let's, let's say somebody is caught shoplifting at a mall. The guy who's going to book you and, you know, charge you with larceny or whatever is not the mall policeman. That's the cop. All the mall policeman can do is drag you off to a little windowless room somewhere in the bowels of the mall and hang on to you until the actual police arrive. So they do have some protective capability, just not as much authority over the matter as the actual police do. 
and antigen presenting, presenting cells are the same. So imagine a case where, let's say you get a cut, and you get a cut from a piece of wood, and on that wood are some bacteria. So the bacteria gain access to your connective tissue by hitching a ride on the splinter, and then uh, let's, you know, let's say dendritic cells of the skin. Dendritic cells and macrophages are going to get to work eating the bacteria that made it into you on that piece of wood. So that's actually not the end of it. So the, den the dendritic cells, the Langerhans cells of the skin, and the macrophages are going to digest some of the pathogens they ate, but in the other portions, they are going to save or hang on to a particular piece of the pathogen, and what they do is they put it on their surface, and then they amble up to another cell, typically a T or a B cell, and basically hold the piece of the pathogen up to the other cell and effectively say, hey, I found this over here, do you recognize it? And if the answer is yes, an immune response is mounted. So let's talk about major histocompatibility complex proteins. That's what MHC stands for. Um, and these are genetically determined, so they are heritable, is another way to say that. So you get the combo of them that you have from your mom and dad. Which means that your set is unique. So, even though you have your own unique set, and we all do, you can divide these into classes. So all of your nucleated cells have class 1 MHCs. So remember when I introduced the idea of antigens and cell surface markers in blood, I said all of the cells of your body carry around a name tag, and that name tag identifies those cells as belonging to you, right? Well, that's what I was talking about. So in addition to the ABO and RH factor blood groups, you also have MHCs on the rest of your cells. So specifically the ones with nuclei. So um, again, when I was talking about blood in the blood presentation, one of the students that was present at the Zoom session very smartly asked, oh, so your white blood cells don't go to your donor when you donate blood? And I said, no, because they have markers on them that identify them as not being uh, belonging to the patient. So that would cause an immune reaction. So when I said that, what I meant was these. Class 2s are on lymphocytes specifically and on the antigen presenting cells. So the class 2 MHCs, which I'm multiply circling here, are how lymphocytes and APCs talk to each other. So they talk to each other via MHCs, specifically class 2. So class one major histocompatibility proteins, and remember these are all nucleated cells. These are undergoing continuous production. So the reason that we specify nucleated is because the nucleus contains the genes that code for the MHC proteins. And these are constantly being transcribed, translated, and translocated to the surface of the cell. It's a way that the cell displays on its surface hey, all systems are normal, I am fine, nothing is wrong, and furthermore, I belong here. So it's both a status indicator, uh, the status being, I am fine, I do not have cancer, or a virus, and also an indicator to the immune system that that cell belongs where it is. So for example, the reason that people who receive organ transplants have to take anti-rejection drugs that suppress their immune system is because the class 1 MHCs on their new organ do not match the class 1 MHCs that they are genetically uh, inclined to produce. So that's why anti-rejection drugs are required, because of the difference in MHCs. And this is also the class of proteins that are typically examined, at least in part, when donor matches are being sought. So. For example, if I'm an identical twin 
I can get an organ from my identical twin just fine because genetically we are the same, meaning that our class 1 MHCs are also going to be the same. So, I mentioned status presentation. The purpose of having a class 1 MHC is not for it simply to be there, although that's one of its roles. The other is for it to display signaling peptides. So, normal peptides. So in, in this case, this class 1 MHC is displaying a normal peptide that indicates, hey, everything's normal and fine. If abnormal peptides begin to be displayed instead, this is a red flag to the immune system. Either because the MHC and the antigen are both from somewhere else and therefore need to be taken care of, or because there's something wrong with the cell and it's no longer able to make normal peptides. Okay, so let's use a example. And for the example, we're going to talk about viruses. So I know that this slide says virus or bacterium. Um, I do want you to know that bacteria uh, also can get inside an infected cell. So bacterial cells are many, many times smaller than normal animal cells, which means that some bacteria actually do um, wiggle their way inside your cells and infect them from the inside. Not all, but some. But since we are living in the time of coronavirus, um, I want to use the viral example a little bit more intentionally uh, just to help you guys understand what's going on right now and help you understand a little bit more about the biology of viruses and how they're transmitted, how they're passed, and how they're dealt with by the immune system. So in order to do this, let's zoom in a little bit which unfortunately means I can't also use my laser pointer, but that's fine. I can use the Epic Pen instead. So one thing to know about viruses is a virus is RNA or DNA. So either a virus or a retrovirus, um, retroviruses or RNA. Uh, we're not going to go into the specifics of that. You can ask me outside of class, however, that's fine. So there are an ARDNA DNA and then also a protein capsule. So the protein capsule is what's pictured here. Generally, the protein capsule is what gives the virus access to the cell. So it has some way of breaking open the plasma membrane and injecting the little bit of DNA or RNA to inside of the cell. Now, the way viruses work, because they're not alive, they are not cells, um, and because they're just RNA or DNA and protein, they don't have any way to make more of themselves, which is why they go inside our cells. So our cells have a nucleus, and they have ribosomes, and they have an endoplasmic reticulum. They have all of the machinery that a virus needs to replicate itself. So when viruses gain access to our cells, what they're really doing is sneaking in and taking over our factory to make more virus stuff instead of making more cell stuff. Viral proteins are not native to us, and they therefore count as abnormal peptides. So here's what happens next. Those abnormal peptides are incorporated inside of the endoplasmic reticulum into the continuously produced class 1 MHC. So the reason this class 1 MHC is in here is because it was produced somewhere over here and then via the endomembrane system it's going to get transported and coalesce with this abnormal peptide. Um, and this is going to be the signal that needs to go to the surface of the cell to say, hey, something's wrong, I have a virus inside of me. So, Remember, the Golgi apparatus has a cis face, and that's the face that faces the endoplasmic reticulum, and then the trans face, which faces the outside of the cell. So the trans face of the Golgi is going to give rise to a transport vesicle, and the transport vesicle is going to fuse with the surface of the cell, 
and end up with the MHC and the abnormal protein displayed on the surface. So this is an antigen presenting cell. So this antigen presenting cell is going to have that abnormal peptide in an MHC and then it's going to go over to a T or a B cell and say, hey, um, I found this thing. Do you know about it? So I want to exit. Can I? Yeah, there we go. All right. So class two are also involved. And remember, these are on antigen presenting cells and all nucleated cells. Um, and so the previous case, let me just go back here really quick. This can happen to antigen presenting cells or just regular cells, so infected cells, for example. Uh, I do want to stress antigen presenting cells can also be infected, um, but typically they're not. So in this case, this would be an infected cell or an antigen presenting cell. Um, most commonly, a non-APC infected with something. So that's what I mean there. I realized I was a little bit unclear when I was walking through this slide, so I wanted to make sure I clarify that before we move on. Okay, so imagine this is like, I don't know, a skin cell or something. So, during an infection, um, and it, it doesn't have to be a viral infection, it can be a bacterial infection as well, it just depends. Um, antigen presenting cells, like the dendritic cells of the skin and others, uh, can do what I described them doing, and that's uh, eat bacteria or drink whatever is in their surroundings from the ECF, and then they can stick that abnormal antigen fragment into their class 2 MHCs. And that's going to go over and activate a T cell. So here's a little bit more of an intimate view about how the class 2 MHCs work. It's really similar to how an infected cell would do, except for now instead of class 1 MHCs we have class 2. Um, so, here we have a phagocytic antigen presenting cell, could be a macrophage, could be something else. And in this case, it's a bacterium. So we have this bacterium, it's going to eat the bacterium. And then, in order to disable the bacterium and prevent it from doing any harm, we just fuse that uh, endosome, which is the name for that little vesicle that forms after phagocytosis, um, and fuse it with the lysosome so that we end up chopping up the bacterium. However, these little red circles that were formerly on the surface of the bacterial cell, uh, these are important because these are the, the piece of the pathogen that is antigenic. So class 2 major histocompatibility complex proteins are produced and this vesicle containing one is going to fuse with the vesicle containing the leftovers of the dead bacteria. And then hold it up on its surface. So after that, this antigen presenting cell, let's say it's in the connective tissue in your dermis, um, it's going to wander over to the nearest lymph node carrying this MHC class 2 and its antigenic fragment. And once it's inside the lymph node, it's going to go up to a bunch of different lymphocytes and show it to them to see if that initiates an immune response. Okay, so quick overview because repetition is our friend. Um, so up here we have what is typically an infected cell. So a viral or bacterial pathogen is going to have gained access to the cell. In either case, that results in weird proteins being produced, proteins that are not normal. And those abnormal peptides are incorporated into a class 1 MHC, and then that's displayed on the cell surface. 
So this is going to be noticed by the immune system and probably, let's say this is a virally infected cell for example, probably this top cell is going to die because it's going to be killed by an immune cell. In the other case, we've got phagocytic antigen presenting cells, so things like Langerhans slash dendritic cells of the skin, macrophages and others, and these guys are going to actively attack and eat something. They're going to digest that something and then display the parts of that something on their surface, typically to T cells in the, in the nearest lymph node. Speaking of T cells, so T cells general jobs include, but are not limited to, antigen presentation. So certain kinds of T cells can present antigens themselves. Antigen recognition and co-stimulation. We'll talk about co-stimulation, so if you're confused about that, you won't be for long. And then activation of some specific subclasses of T cells which have very specific jobs. Okay, so let's define some abbreviations real quick. So T sub C means cytotoxic T cells. So when you see that abbreviation, that's what I mean. So an antigen presenting cell is going to take an antigen up to a T cell of this variety and try to recognize it. So the specific T cell receptors, and these are specific to particular antigens, There's a huge variety of them. So 2.5 times 10 to the seventh different T cell receptors, at least as far as we currently know. So this is going to happen regardless. So T cell receptors are going to bind with MHC proteins and kind of quote unquote look at the antigen being presented. After that, two things can happen. If it's the wrong T cell and that T cell is not the T cell that's specific to that antigen, nothing will happen. So it just is like, I don't know, I don't know that guy. So that means no effect. Or if the antigen presenting cell has selected the correct T cell, it's going to say, oh yeah, I remember that antigen. That's from two years ago when we had this viral infection. And then that initiates a big signaling cascade which kicks off the immune response to that antigen. So we have a really, really different effect size depending on recognition or not, where uh, there's no effect at all or no functional change if there's no recognition. But if recognition occurs, a lot of really important things happen at once. So recognition means a specific T cell, a cytotoxic T cell, binds to specific antigens on the infected cell or when presented by an antigen presenting cell. Okay, co-stimulation. So here we're going to keep with the uh, infected cell motif. Um, so antigen recognition, let's, let's assume that they're recognizing. So here we have a T cell and it's got its little receptor right here and these are the MHCs, class one, of the infected cell. So if we zoom in on what's happening, not only do you have the class 1 MHC of the infected cell displaying the antigen, which is usually weird peptide, the T cell receptor in this case recognizes this weird peptide. So it's not the case where the T cell receptor says, hmm, I don't know that thing. In this case, the T cell receptor is specific to this antigen, and that initiates co-stimulation. <laughs> 
So co-stimulation is a second step. It has a lot of complexities and we don't have time to go into all of them. So what you need to know about co-stimulation is that it's an extra step beyond MHC and receptor binding. So let's say secondary to secondary to MHC and receptor binding. And specifically, the proteins released, again, you don't need to know which protein specifically, but the proteins release induce the production of those clones. So that's the kickoff step for clones. Now, among the clones, some of them are going to be warriors, so active T cells. These are the ones that are going to actually participate in fighting off the infection. There are also memory T cells produced, and memory cytotoxic T cells, these don't actually participate in the battle. Instead, they hang around to remember the pathogen for the next time. And both have important roles. So, once antigen recognition has occurred, you get productions of clones. All of those clonally produced cytotoxic T cells have the same receptor for that initial antigen. And that means they can attack any cell that bears that antigen. So, what's in your clone army? Well, I mentioned these first two guys. So, the actual soldiers or warriors. These are the cells that are going to go to battle to fight off whatever's trying to infect you. The memory T cells, you can think of these as being the historians. So they're not warriors, they don't participate in the fight, instead they sit back and remember in case of next time. And then suppressor T cells. These are also very important because you don't want the cytotoxic T cells to be active longer than they need to be. So these are the peacemakers. They tell the warriors to stop fighting once fighting is no longer required. So it helps to limit the immune response degree so that the immune response is not of a larger magnitude than is appropriate for the infection. It also helps to end the cycle once the infection has been successfully fought off. So I mentioned cytotoxic T cells uh, are basically the perpetrators of cell-on-cell -cell violence, and that's true. So let's look at how that works. So the basics of this are as follows. Cytotoxic T cells are going to attack cells, but only infected cells that have that weird peptide that they recognize. And this is important because you don't want them to attack the wrong cells. So this is why recognition and co-stimulation and the production of clones specific to that antigen is very, very important. So once the clone army is produced, they're going to go find cells displaying that abnormal antigen. And usually this is an infected cell. So we have a cell that has either a virus, usually it's a virus or a bacterium. or an abnormal cell. So these can be cells for which the abnormal peptide is not coming from some foreign invader, but rather the abnormal peptide is because the cell has forgotten what its job is. So maybe it's precancerous or even cancerous. So you do have a built-in anti-cancer set of mechanisms mediated by your immune system. And these are cytotoxic T cells, so they can do both. They're very, very powerful and very effective at destroying cells that are sort of not adhering to the norm. So here's how they do this. They release perforins after they dock. So the receptor, which is here, 
on the T cell is going to bind to the class 1 MHC. And they're going to release perforins onto the infected cell. So perforins are proteins that polymerize a hole in the membrane. So basically the cytotoxic T cell is going to walk up to the infected cell and start punching holes in it. Into that hole they dump something called granzymes. And granzymes are a group of enzymes that induce apoptosis. They also release lymphotoxins uh, which are toxins that kill the cell. So the way lymphotoxins work is disruption of cell metabolism so they affect for example mitochondrial function. Uh, cytokines stimulate apoptosis um, and in part those are mediated by granzymes and then perforins punch holes in the membrane. So it's really a three-pronged attack and it's very, very effective at destroying target cells. So, one of the key components of the immune system is the timing of things. And here's why. I'm sure we've all experienced the onset of illness where like maybe day one you're like, oh, I feel a little bit off today. And then day two you're like, oh no, I'm getting sick. And then by day three you're like, I feel miserable. So, there's this window between when you are initially exposed to something and when the clone army has enough numbers to be affected. So oftentimes during this two days, this is the window for infection to either take hold or not. Especially if it's your first exposure, um, for example, then it can be very, very nasty. Okay, so let's talk about helper T cells. That's what T sub H means, helper T. And these guys, remember, have basically an assistance role rather than a primary role. So helper T cells um, they have receptors for specific antigens as well, so just like cytotoxic T cells, they are specific to their antigens. So they're going to dock with an antigen presenting cell as well. So the antigen presenting cell says, hey, do you recognize this? And the cyto or excuse me, the helper T cell is going to say yes or no. And same deal as with cytotoxic T cells. If the answer is no, they disconnect and the antigen presenting cell will just move along. If the answer is yes, let's look at what happens. So this is a CD4 helper T cell, so it's going to dock with the antigen presenting cell. Remember APCs have class 2 major histocompatibility complexes. So those MHCs are going to show the antigen if the receptor matches, co-stimulation will occur. So this also requires co-stimulation, so in addition. And remember I don't need you to specifically know what co-stimulation proteins are released, just that it's an extra step in addition to binding that involves the release of proteins that stimulate the receiving cell, so in this case the CD4 helper T cell. So helper T cells uh, are underappreciated historically, um, so they have this kind of silly name helper, like they're not the primary mover and shaker of the immune system, but rather they just sort of function as like an executive assistant. That's not the case. So in order to have a healthy functioning immune system, you need helper T cells because helper T cells are going to amplify the immune response. So they release cytokines, which remember are cell signaling molecules. And those cytokines are going to basically rally the immune system. So boost clonal selection of cytotoxic T cells, allow communication between the humoral or antibody mediated immune system and the, or, and the cell mediated immune system. And 
Helper T cells have their own variety of memory cells as well. So active helper T cells are going to help coordinate the battle. And memory helper T cells are just like regular helper, regular memory cells, there to remember for the future. Let's try writing that E again. That was terrible. So even within one quote unquote type of lymphocyte, the T cell, we've seen memory cytotoxic T cells and just regular cytotoxic T cells. And now we've seen active helper T cells and memory helper T cells. So the variety of T cells is significant. So I mentioned that helper T cells are important because they basically coordinate the battle and nothing could be more true. So without going into too much specific detail about what they do, because their, their list of jobs and responsibilities is really long and complex, um, basically they are coordinators. So they function in sort of a general capacity. And by, I'm, I'm using general meaning like a general of a military organization. So they're, they're issuing directions. They're coordinating actions. They are causing maturation of things. They're calling macrophages over. They're also providing the link between cellular immunity and humoral immunity. So let's write that down. So those interconnecting arrows I showed you in that diagram were basically the helper T cells. So they have the ability to talk to the B cell and humoral immunity side of things and activate the antibody side of things simultaneously, which really is a big help. So the reason I'm basically being so vocal about how important these cells are is because CD4 helper T cells, let's go back a couple, These are the cells that HIV targets. So human immunodeficiency virus, which is what HIV stands for, targets these. So HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, is the name for the specific virus that causes AIDS, which is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So now that we're learning a little bit more about the immune system and about viral biology, Let's go read that list of helper T cell jobs again and see if we can't figure out why HIV and AIDS are so bad. So if you knock out CD4 helper T cells, you are knocking out their ability to do any of this stuff. So deactivating CD4 helper T cells effectively kicks the legs out from under your immune system. And in fact, um, for people who have untreated AIDS or HIV, if they end up with AIDS, which is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, um, not everybody who has HIV has AIDS, that's important to stress. Uh, if that individual ends up with AIDS, they're very, very vulnerable to infections that are not HIV. So in fact, most folks who end up passing away due to HIV infection and age, AIDS, they're not dying directly from their HIV viral infection but rather they are dying because a pathogen that they would ordinarily be able to fight off, they can no longer fight off. Additionally, folks who are immunocompromised in some way, um, they're gonna be either due to illness, unable to coordinate the activity of specific helper T cells or due to anti-rejection drugs, for example. So, Anti-rejection drugs are a group of drugs which suppress parts of the immune system that would otherwise be responsible for attacking somebody's uh, transplanted organ. So 
the reason I'm making such a big deal out of this is because we are living in a time when hand sanitizing and wearing gloves in public and wearing masks in public to minimize the transmission of coronavirus is becoming commonplace, but it's also contested. And one of the reasons that it's important to obey those social contracts around making sure that you're not spreading things is because there are folks in our population who have immune systems that are impaired. Either they're impaired because they have some sort of immunodeficiency disease that they've acquired, um, could be AIDS, could be something else, or because they've received an organ transplant and their immune system is suppressed so that they can survive. And there are plenty of other reasons besides. For example, people with lupus taking drugs to suppress their immune system because they have an autoimmune disorder. Um, so really, by wearing masks and wearing gloves and, you know, not breathing on things and whatnot, um, we're not doing that stuff primarily to protect the healthiest among us. For example, uh, I'm young, I'm relatively healthy, I have, you know, a fairly robust medical history with relatively little illness. If I caught coronavirus, I would probably be fine. It would suck for a while, but I would, odds are, I would be okay. However, the same cannot be said of folks whose immune system is severely compromised. So a lot of what we're doing by doing this social distancing stuff is really protecting those members of our population whose immune system is unprepared to handle the challenge of a severe viral infection like corona. So that is why. Um, if not for yourself, then do it for other people. People who can't do it for themselves. So cytokines is a word I've mentioned several times so far, and I've characterized them as being sort of general communication chemicals. And that's true. So um, cytokines are really critical for the immune system as well, and they come in a variety of sort of uh, quote unquote flavors. So I do expect you to know the categories of them. But, like, for example, interleukins, there's almost 20 kinds of them. You don't have to know the 20 different kinds of interleukins. You just have to know the general function of each of these broader categories. Um, so interleukins, inter means between, and leukin means cell. So interleukins are chemicals that allow white blood cells to talk to each other. So Usually these are produced by lymphocytes and macrophages, but they're also produced by other cells, including um, astrocytes in the brain, fibroblasts and fibrocytes in the connective tissue, etc. <clears throat> so they have a variety of functions, um, including changing sensitivity to antigens, as well as stimulating B cell activity so they can increase the rate at which the humoral immune system is activated. So as you might imagine, stimulating B cell activity is probably primarily going to come from helper T cells, right? So interleukins produced by helper T cells. They can also enhance nonspecific defenses um, and coordinate the immune response. So think of them as being a jack-of-all-trades inter-white blood cell communicator. <clears throat> Interferons are also important, um, and then interferons are interesting because they can also be used as a drug. I'm not going to address that application of them directly in this lecture because I have a lot of video to record today and I just don't have time. Uh, but if you're curious about interferons being used as a drug, um, ask me about it outside of class and I'll, I'll share what I know with you. It's, it's not everything, obviously, but I do know some stuff. So one thing interferons do is help prevent viral infection. So basically, the cell that's making interferons and that cell's neighbors are going to be stimulated to make more interferons, and they slow the spread of the virus, basically. So their interferons are heavily associated with viral infection. It's also going to serve as a signal that a viral infection is afoot. So if I, for example, took some extracellular fluid or some plasma from somebody and I tested it for alpha interferons, for example, um, 
and I saw high levels of interferons, I would suspect that that person had an active viral infection. Beta interferons are going to slow the process of inflammation. So inflammation has its uses, but if inflammation gets out of control, uh, it can make healing really difficult. So beta interferons kind of mediate that role. And then gamma interferons come from what are called natural killer cells. Um, natural killer cells are the kind of uh, cytotoxic T cell that are specifically going to go after cells that are cancerous. Tumor necrosis factors, uh, speaking of cells that are cancerous, um, tumor necrosis factors are what they sound like. So they are targeted at tumors. Tumors are clumps of abnormal cancerous cells that are growing and cell cycling out of control. Tumor necrosis factors are secreted by macrophages and cytotoxic T cells to try to kill that population of cells. And then we have other kinds of cytokines. So phagocyte activating chemicals. So basically these are going to increase macrophage activity among other things. Um, and also keep the macrophages around. Colony stimulating factors, these are basically going to encourage the production of white blood cells and then other ones. So we talked about leukotrienes, lymphotoxins, perforin, etc. So they're just kind of a catch-all uh, cytokine class. All right, and this part of the immune system presentation has gone on long enough, so I'm going to stop the presentation here, and I will catch up with you in the next slide set when we talk about humoral immunity. So part two of this PowerPoint is up next.